Good evening and welcome to tonight's broadcast. We're so glad you joined us. We'd especially like to welcome all of our first time guests. If this is your first time with us, we'd encourage you to visit our website at newworkupc.info where you can find out more about us, join in a small group, submit a prayer request, and so much more. Now this week's theme is the journey of Christmas. And tonight, Pastor Desi is going to tell us the fascinating story about Simeon and Anna. Take it away, Pastor Desi. Hello, Newark family, and welcome back once again to our evening broadcast. Tonight is Sunday, December 6th, and I am excited to be bringing to you the next part in our series of this journey of Christmas. And I get to talk about another kind of minor character, if you will, that takes place in the Christmas story that perhaps you've read about before, but we often kind of overlook. And I'm going to talk about Simeon. Now, on our Thursday evening broadcast of last week, Sister Debbie talked about Anna. And both of these characters, Simeon and Anna, are found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2. And if you blink, you'll miss it. They've just got these tiny little parts in the story, but I believe they're very important parts. And Simeon in particular, I requested to do this broadcast because he's one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story. And stick with me and I'm going to explain why. Let's start by reading a little scripture. I'm going to read Simeon's part of this narrative, and we're going to take it from Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 25 through verse 35, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, and he was a righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So, when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. And he took the child in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Poof, that's it. Right after that, Anna comes onto the scene. As Sister Debbie talked about, she's only in three verses. And then we change scenes and we leave the temple grounds all together. And so we've got just this short little bit about this old man named Simeon and this old woman named Anna. And they're there as Jesus and his parents are in the temple. Now, what's the significance of this? And why do I personally love this story so much? Well, to set that, I need to back up and tell you a little more about what's going on. So Jesus was born eight days before in the town of Bethlehem. And at this point, being a male child and being eight days old, his parents have now brought him to the temple grounds. They've walked from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, which is just a few miles. And Jesus is going to be circumcised, which is kind of a rite of passage for baby male children in the nation of Israel. And as part of this circumcision process, they were to bring an offering, a sacrifice. Now, we are fairly certain that Joseph and Mary did not have much money at this point because according to Levitical law, if you did not have enough money to offer the proper normal sacrifice for a baby male that was being circumcised, you could offer two turtle doves. And we know from a few verses earlier in Luke chapter 2 that they indeed had purchased two turtle doves to offer with Jesus' circumcision. So we get from that that they're probably not very well off, or at least at this time, they don't have much money. Now, let's talk about the temple for a second. 
I don't know about you, but having read this story in the past and having been younger when I read it, I because Mary and Joseph and Jesus are the main characters and we've got Simeon as a character and then Anna as a character, it's easy to imagine, if you will, like this was a play and there's a stage as so you got, you know, a man and a woman and a baby and then here's this guy talking to them and then this other old lady enters into the scene as if there are four adults and a baby on the set, and that's what's going on. But that's not what's going on at all. In reality, the Temple Grounds, first off, was huge. We're talking 40 square acres. It's a whole complex of buildings and all kinds of bustling activity. Think more like the county fairgrounds as far as its size. And think of the county fairgrounds on a busy day with lots of people coming in and out, and there's vendors and they're selling things. There's a stockyard over in one corner where there are cows and there are goats and there are turtle doves and there are all kinds of you know animals that people can purchase for sacrifice. There are merchants who are selling things. There's a money exchange booth where people have to exchange their money for the temple cur currency. There are what we call the temple guards, think the private police force that are around the temple grounds. There are Levitical priests who are going back and forth and administering duties. Inside this temple grounds are multiple different courtyards working their way up, literally like getting higher and further into the temple grounds. And you have the court of Gentiles, and then you've got a court of women, and then you've got a court of men, and then you've got the priestly court where only they could enter in. So there's all this activity. There are thousands upon thousands of people there. At best, they're in the court of women, maybe the court of Gentiles, because Mary's with them. She would not have been allowed into the court of men, and certainly not into the priestly court. So they're not alone by any means. This is a bustling, thriving place with lots of activity that's going on. Jesus has been dedicated at this point, to use our modern terminology. He has been circumcised. They are probably, from the way the story is set up, on their way out of the temple. Now, at this point, they come across this older man. Now, keep in mind, there's lots of people. There's lots of activity going on. They would have crossed by many, many different people. And people right now don't really know Mary and Joseph. They're a poor couple. They're from the north. Their accent probably gives them away. They're more of a rural country area that they come from. And quite frankly, they're nobodies in the temple system. And this old man stops them. And the scripture is very explicit that Simeon had been led by the Holy Spirit to come to the temple that day. So picture now a young couple that don't have very much. They're in a foreign city. They're in a very bustling, busy, active area. They're making their way out of the temple grounds after the circumcision ceremony. And this old man stops to talk to them. Who knows how many people had stopped to talk to them? My imagination says probably not a whole lot of people. They're rather unimportant if you think of all the bustle in a temple. But this old man stops to talk to them. And he's excited to meet them. And he asks to see this baby. And so this old man touches and holds this child. And I'm reading a little between the lines, I'll tell you that. But this is how the scene plays out in my head. And remember, there's people walking around them and there's all kinds of activity going on and people are probably passing around them to their right or their left. And they're standing there in this courtyard and they're talking to this old man and he picks up this baby and he has this absolute look of wonder on his face. And this is my imagination, but I believe that tears probably came to his eyes. And he looks up to heaven and he thanks God that he got to hold this child. And then he opens his mouth and as the Spirit leads him, he begins to prophesy. And he prays and he thanks God that as an old man, he can now die in peace because he has seen the salvation of his nation. And not just his nation, he has seen the salvation of all the nations as he holds this little baby. And he thanks God that this light has come and he's the glory of Israel. And then he does something even weirder and cryptic. He looks at the parents and he specifically looks at this young mother, probably a teenage mother, as he's holding this little baby. And he looks at her and he says that this amazing little baby boy is going to be the salvation of many, but he is also going to be a stumbling block. And there are going to be people who will oppose him. And he looks at this mama and he says, someday this little baby is going to reveal the inner thoughts, the deepest secrets of the hearts of many people. 
And I think he probably paused for a second. And he looks at that mama and he says, and a sword, deep grief, deep pain is going to pierce your very soul at what this child does. And the scriptures say that Joseph and Mary take this all in in amazement. This is the setting for where this story takes place. Now let's talk about Simeon for a moment longer. And let's back up outside the temple grounds and talk about what's going on in the first century at this time. Israel is a land that has been back and forth for several hundred years now under different rules. Uh, you've got the Maccabean revolts, and you've got the Ptolemaic Empire that had been there, and the Seleucids, and you've got Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and all the drama that had happened in Egypt, which is a nation just south of them not too long before the lifetime of Jesus. And now the Romans are in, and Israel is a key central ground. Nobody really likes Israel, but they need to control this stretch of land so that the Roman Empire to the north of them maintains its control, and to the south of them, they can get to Egypt, the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. They need that land. Israel is this stopover. Today, we'd call it a flyover state. It's this place that nobody wants to be, think Roman Empire, but they've got military outposts there. They've changed hands multiple times. There's been many different revolts. The Jews don't want them there. The Romans don't really want to be there. You've had risings, you've had uprisings, and you've had different revolts, and they've been crushed over and over. You've got the people who are running the temple grounds right now, and nobody really likes that political party, the Sadducees, but they have cooperated with the Romans. You've got the Pharisees, and they're the pious, super religious ones who want to restore order to the nation of Israel and preserve their culture. You've got the zealots who are saying, we need to do another uprising. Think something like guerrilla fighters. You've got all of this turmoil. You've got the Essenes who used to run the temple grounds. They've been kicked out of the temple, and now they set up a community out in the desert, several miles away from the city of Jerusalem. They're too pious for everyone. They've removed themselves from society. And then you've got all the normal people in the middle, like Simeon, who are watching all of this political strife going on. And if you think we have strife in our politics today, it's nothing compared to what they were dealing with. Our politics are not leading to mass executions by a foreign occupied military that's declared martial law in our country. This is the environment Jesus is born into. And by this point, Simeon is an old man. He has watched all of this turmoil unfold over his lifetime. And scripture makes it clear that he's a righteous man and he's deeply grieved by everything that's happened around him. Simeon's a man of prayer. And in his prayer time, God has promised this man that before his life ends, before he dies, one day he will see the salvation of his nation. Think about what Simeon heard in that prayer. Simeon has been promised by God that someday before he dies, he is going to see everything change. He is going to see Israel redeemed. He is going to see the long-awaited anointed one, the Messiah, the one who is going to come and save Israel from the plight that they are in. And this man has been faithful to God his whole life. And he has been praying. And this morning, he wakes up. And in his morning prayer time, God speaks to him and says, go to the temple. And today, Simeon, today is your day. You are going to see the Savior that I have sent. You're going to see the anointed one, the Messiah, who's going to rescue Israel. Now just pause there for a second. What would you be thinking if you're Simeon? What kind of anticipation would you have? What kind of excitement would you have as you make your way to the temple grounds? And remember, this is not a building. This is more like fairgrounds, 40 square acres. This is a huge complex. There are thousands and thousands of people and all kinds of activity going on. And so Simeon shows up at the temple and he's waiting for God to direct him what to do. And I imagine, and I'll admit it's my imagination, that Simeon's looking around thinking, where is he? Who's the guy? Who's the man, my thoughts, he's probably thinking, who's this man who's going to rescue us? I finally get to meet our long-awaited anointed one, our Messiah, who's going to rescue us. And as he's standing in the temple grounds, this couple walks by, this young couple with a baby, a little baby boy. And he can tell by their clothes, this is not a rich couple. This is not a royal couple. They're just regular 
everyday people who don't have very much. And the spirit prompts him and says, go talk to them. See that little baby? That's him. That is the salvation of Israel. And so Simeon goes over and he talks to this little couple. And mama agrees to let him hold the baby. And Simeon picks up this little baby boy. And he looks at this baby. And he breaks down. And he begins to praise God. And here is this old man holding a little infant. An eight-day-old baby. Eight days old. It can't do anything yet. And yet when he looks in the eyes of this eight-day-old baby boy, he sees the future of his nation. He sees the salvation of his people. He sees the salvation not only of his people, but a light that's been prepared for all nations. This old man is holding this eight-day-old baby and in his hands is the salvation of everyone. He's waited his whole lifetime for redemption. He's waited his whole lifetime for salvation to come. How long, oh God, must we suffer under this rule? And now as he's looking down at this eight-day-old baby boy, he can die in peace. And he knows that God's plan is coming to fruition. And there's a future hope. And it's going to start looking up. But in looking at this little baby boy, he also knows because God is speaking to him. And he's, the Spirit is prophesying through him as he's holding this baby that not everybody's going to accept it. Not everyone is going to accept this message that this little baby is going to bring and that people are going to reject this baby. And someday, what this little baby is going to do will change the world. And people are either going to love or absolutely hate and object and reject what this baby is going to do and what it represents. And while he's looking at this baby, the Spirit speaks to him and says, and the mother of that child is going to be cut deep, pierced through to the heart with the grief that is going to come because of this child. And I believe the Spirit is speaking to Simeon and he, in holding that little baby boy, knows not only will this child bring the salvation of many, this child is going to bring incredible pain and is going to suffer incredible pain. Perhaps the Spirit spoke to Simeon, and he knew that one day this little boy was going to die because of his message, and it was going to crush that mother. And so a lifetime of righteousness and prayer climaxes at the end of this man's life as he holds this eight-day-old baby and it's nothing like he expected. It's not a king. It's not someone royal. It's not a mighty man of valor. There's not a warrior standing in front of him. It's a baby. A brand new infant baby boy. That he has been waiting to meet his entire life. And now at the end of his life, he is holding not meeting and saluting, not meeting and kneeling down to, not meeting, you know, in admiration, another strapping man. No, 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 no. He is holding his salvation in his hands. And it's a little baby. What an incredible honor. How incredibly humbling. How radically different that I think Simeon was expecting to happen when he came into the temple that day. We don't know for sure what he was thinking, but I personally don't think that he was looking to meet a baby. And yet he rejoiced. There was wonder and excitement and awe and praise and even some sorrow mixed in this meeting as he saw what that child represented 
and what was coming in the future. And much like that, it's still that way for us today. It's at Christmas time that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the birth of God become human, come to save us. And it's a mix of lots of different things. There is praise and there's adoration and there is joy, but there's also sorrow. As you've heard through this broadcast, not just tonight, but this whole series on the journey of Christmas, there are ups and downs, even in the birth of Jesus, and they're still reflected in us today. And there is joy and sorrow, pain and grief. There is praise and excitement, all of it, all intermixed in the Christmas story, all of it intermixed in our salvation process. And what happens when things unexpected come to us? What happens when we are surprised and our expectations don't live up to what we thought. And the reality that's handed to us is very different than what we were hoping for. And the reality that this old man faced was that he was looking at the salvation, but it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. And it wasn't going to be the man that he met. No, 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 no. He got to hold a week old baby. Eight days. One week old. Just a little over one week. And it's an infant. It can't sit up, it can't speak, it can't feed itself, it can't do anything but just lay there and possibly cry. A fragile little human being that represented the salvation of the world. The God who created the entire universe limited himself and became a human and started as a baby, and this old man is holding the creator of the world. And no, he probably didn't realize that he was holding the creator of the world, but he knew that in his hands was the future salvation of his whole nation. And although his expectations were probably fulfilled that day very differently than he thought when he got up that morning and the Spirit told him to go to the temple, Simeon rejoiced. And likewise, today, as we come into this Christmas season, and it's a mix of all kinds of emotions, when we deal with things that don't turn out the way we anticipated, when our expectations are different than our reality, can we still find wonder and amazement? Can we still be excited at what God is doing? Like Simeon, can we be sensitive enough to the Spirit that we can see way down the road and recognize plans that God has. Even things that may not be fulfilled in our lifetime. Even things that maybe they won't be fulfilled until we're very, very old and much farther down the road. And it won't look anything like what we probably wanted it to look like or what we imagined. And yet, it's still God's plan. And so like Simeon, I encourage all of you, I implore you this year, as you deal with Christmas, Lean into all of the emotions and all of the expectations and disappointments and everything that happens with Christmas, with the ups and the downs. You will experience a much richer, a much fuller holiday season if you will accept this going in and recognize that even when our expectations are very different than the reality we're confronted with, we can still find joy and we can find wonder, we can find amazement, we can praise God just like Simeon did. Can you hold your expectations lightly for what God is planning to do in your life? Like that old man who's holding this little fragile baby boy? Can we trust God with our tomorrows and our future? Even as he speaks to us and we're beginning to understand it's not what we thought it was going to be. But can we trust God? God, like Simeon did that day as he held this little baby, that whatever is coming in the future, God has a plan and it's going to work out for his glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. This Christmas, be surprised in unexpected ways. Find joy even in expectations that are not met as you would hope they would be. Heavenly Father, as we close out this broadcast tonight, I pray that somebody who's listening to this, you've been speaking to, and there's something that is stirred in their heart. 
Maybe there are some dormant promises. Maybe there are things that you spoke to them, perhaps even a long time ago, and you're stirring them within them again. Perhaps this Christmas season, they're confronted with a reality that's very, very different than they anticipated. But you are there with us. You are Emmanuel, God with us. And your spirit continues to guide us. And during this season, no matter what circumstances we are facing, we find joy and we find peace and comfort in the fact that you are with us. So help our spiritual eyes to be open to what you're doing. Help our ears to be in tune with your voice. Help our hearts to be sensitive to where you're leading us. And may things turn out the way you intended. May we find joy and wonder and amazement and excitement and praise and what you're doing in our lives and in this season, even if our expectations are confronted with a very different reality. May we have the attitude and the posture and the heart of Simeon this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining this broadcast tonight. Look around you. I believe that if your eyes are truly in tune and your ears are paying attention to what God has in store this Christmas season, no matter what your circumstances are, you can find joy and wonder and amazement and excitement at where God is taking you and what he's speaking in your spirit. Have a great evening. child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping who remain just greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King who shares God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him in since gold and Thank you, Pastor Desi, for that wonderful message. And thank you for joining us this evening and spending your time with us. I'd just like to remind you again to visit our website at newarkupc.info where you can join a small group, submit a prayer request, and partner with us in giving. Now, while you're there, check out our December events card where you can find out all of the exciting things that are going on this December. Have a blessed night, and we look forward to seeing you on our next broadcast.